Hi. Okay, this is working great. So I'm Milos, and this is my colleague Christopher. We'll talk about how we introduced Kubeflow and really drastically change how the data science process is done in PepsiCo. So, why Kubeflow? <laughs> it's a good question. We already had Kubernetes system. We already had the team, infrastructure team, to like, do all, all the stuff related to that, to maintain it. And then the Kubeflow was really a logical thing to add, especially when you think about all the add-ons it has, like the ways that you can easily serve models, which is typically a big problem. Like I, I've witnessed many times that projects just fail because there's no chance to put them in production. So that's one thing very important for us. Second thing is definitely hyperparameter tuning. We all know that uh, for good models, we need to do a proper hyperparameter tuning, and we really don't want our data scientists to just run something on their own machine and then wait for like two days, just like total waste of time. Uh, of course, like training models and all that stuff on the infrastructure. So practically, Kubeflow help us with, with that. So how we organize ourselves? Uh, we organize practically, let's say, in three groups. One group is infrastructure people. So they, as I said, like manage Azure cloud, handle all the maintenance, do all the stuff, uh, permissions, onboarding uh, people on, on the platform, and that kind of stuff. Also screaming about costs <laughs> to us. <laughs> uh, second group, it's us. First, we were called MLOps, but we quickly changed the name to MLE because we are practically just specializing on helping data scientists to use Kubeflow and the whole platform around it to be able to do their job properly. And the, idea, the whole idea of this story is that we want data scientists to improve models. That's what their, like, their skills are and that's where they can create the biggest like, benefit for the company. We don't want them to, I don't know, create over and over again some same code, like code to extract data or something. No, like we will provide all of that. We just want them to focus on, on, the, on, on, the, on the actual model, improving models. And yeah, the third group, data scientists, but it's not just data scientists. There's like other, other teams across the company that are already using it. And the whole idea is, of course, to like build the cool stuff, but that is unfortunately like much easier to say than, than done. But okay, let's, let's go next and see what was like the original problem. So approximately like, 15 months ago, we started with all this effort. I will just try to explain like, how, how, how the projects were done. Like, so you have um, like business owners sending some requests to say, hey, we want, I don't know, some predictions of whatever. Then data scientist working on his own machine was like getting some dump of data, creating something locally. And after some time, there was uh, like a model, model that only works like on his own machine. There's no chance you can replicate it. Uh, working totally in isolation. Nobody knows what he was actually doing. So it was really problematic. And then when they want to get the new predictions, for example, it was really funny. Like, then they send him, like, literally they send him an email with new data. Then he gets the data, runs again the model, but think about maybe he's already on the, some other projects, so he has to re like revert and go back. Then he runs the data, then like send the email back. So this is really, really not efficient, even funny. And uh, as I said, like really uh, it, 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 almost impossible to put in production to automate uh, problems with libraries, etc. So it's a total mess. Of course, yeah, as I said, like collaboration zero, like everybody working in isolation, they are like all members of the same team, but working in some different projects and they don't even know, don't know what, who is doing what. Everything is, it was so, so isolated. Of course, as I said, production is very painful thing. So it's also a big problem because like, okay, they create them all and now what? Like it's, it's a huge problem, like how to put something to production. Like, uh, so practically data scientists were just left alone to like handle all these things by themselves. And of course it was like really not efficient. It was not working very well. And 
as I said, like wheel was constantly being reinvented. For example, I was going through different repositories and over and over again, they were creating a code to connect to Snowflake, sometimes better, sometimes worse, but all the time, the same stuff. And they spend like two, three days and write tests and everything. And then maybe they're proud, like, oh yeah, this is working, but this is just wasted like three days that they should be focusing on, on the model itself. So the whole procedure like of introducing Qplo, we were at the same time like building a plane and flying it and learning how to fly and everything. So we were learning how to use Qplo. Uh, infrastructure team was uh, learning how to organize, how to maintain all the stuff. And data scientists were practically uh, being forced to like shift from their like cozy little space where they're just using, I don't know, Jupyter notebook, creating some nice little models. And now they have to like understand the whole concept of Kubeflow and how to compile and all of that and, and to learn Kubernetes, right? Because you cannot run from it. So that was really painful in the beginning. So a lot of trials and errors. We only had one little repository with some really poor documentation. I wrote that <laughs> really bad in documentation. So uh, pipelines were complex, you know, like when, when you go and see examples like Kubeflow pipelines, those are all little cozy examples. Wow, this is nice. You read data, like do some cleaning, mod, create a model, I don't know, start case serve. Wow, great, it's, it's working. And we, we, we started with like parallel loops inside parallel loops and then in that inner parallel loop there was like hyperparameter tuning in parallel manner. So it was totally crazy because that's the actual real life uh, problem they had. So we started with totally crazy pipelines. And uh, of course, uh, the, the, how it is implemented, like the, uh, the hyperparameter tuning is, was very complex and all that stuff, like problems with authentication. So all these things were really big problem for our data scientists. And also we have to be aware that uh, the thing is, like uh, people don't wanna change. I was kind of uh, afraid that will be some kind of obstruction. They say, oh, this is not working, this is, bad, like we just want to keep all the things that were before. So we really needed uh, time and we, we needed to invest time and effort to help them to make like as, as uh, how to say, as simple as possible for them to use. So there are no excuses not to use it. First thing, this Chris idea, and I think it's a great idea to like create monorepo. So enough of everybody ha having their own like fields, like little repositories. So everything goes to one big repository. It's very good for collaboration, for knowledge sharing. Uh, that, that was a really good idea. Then we built this Prometheus CLI. It's called Prometheus because it brings like <laughs> light to people, like practically giving a power uh, for data scientists to use Kubeflow more easily. That's built on KFP SDK. And practically it's, well, we'll talk about that in details a little bit later. Uh, there's also some other, other like uh, Greek mythology named uh, parts of this um, whole like ecosystem or, or ML platform. So like component library and common pipeline repo. And so generally the, the whole idea was to just give them all the tools necessary to be as easy as possible and just like let them focus on things that matter. So let's go quickly about this uh, monorepo. What is like, there's some pros and cons for the organization and your company, like whether you want to use it or not. But uh, the idea is to enhance like code visibility, integration and collaboration and uh, dependency management, tooling, standards. So, a lot of a lot of things that I think definitely improve like the business process and and how the things are done, and also now they're not like repeating all all the time the same stuff. They can see like pull requests on something. Say, hey, this is like the project. This is something different, but still there's a lot of common things. Let's just reuse it, and they are also learning. So that's really really good thing. And also here's the joke like because I realized that at one moment of time, I was just like merging pull requests, like never ending. And of course, like, some, like one pull request to cripple them all. So that's something you have to be aware of. Like people have to, like some kind of hygiene is needed. You don't want to end up with like 500 branches and that kind of stuff. So some things should be 
uh, like rules should be followed, but I think it's a very, very good thing. The main part, the most important thing that was built was this CLI. Practically, is a command line tool which tries to hide or underlying Kubernetes things from uh, users, so in our case, data scientists. Um, we like uh, if they want to learn, like no problem. I, I don't have problem. Actually, they're really welcome to learn about like Kubernetes and all, all the things, but I'm just afraid they don't have enough time to, to do that. Like, and maybe as I'm repeating over and over again, maybe they should focus on improving models. So this uh, tool is practically just hiding all those things. Those are all things that are done in the uh, background. Also authentication. So we started with authentication where you had practically to go to user interface where and you, let's say in Chrome, Kubeflow user interface, and then get the cookie, copy, paste it, uh, like uh, expose it as an environmental variable and then run your pipelines. It was kind of pain in the neck. So now that's done just in one line, everything is automated and we'll, we'll show you a little demo about it. Also, recurrent runs are now just implemented with the decorator. They just use like the, 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 the cron uh, syntax to like run it, run just one command and it, it, will, it will create all the stuff they need. Uh, Hyperparameter tuning also is uh, improved. They just define in Python dictionaries and run it. Uh, we already have like all the tools like to uh, create images for them to put in the right ACR place like for container registry on Azure. So all these things are automated. They don't have to think about that. Also deploying case serve practically for them is just to have like one method like predict and there's a decorator where they can just define where they want it to run. And that's it. Like really, really convenient because I know like I was doing like all, all that stuff and it was like, it was hard for me. And then especially for them would be hard to do all, all the things that are currently done, like in Kubeflow. <coughs> also the whole thing of uh, them being able to use the like, GPUs and the uh, large memory machines is now simplified. So it's, very easy for them to use. And again, we have always a kind of a friendly discussion with the infrastructure. They're always trying to lower the costs and we always want to get as much of resources as possible. So this is like, uh, yeah, this kind of uh, how this, this CLI looks like. So this is like, uh, one example, authenticating. And then this is like kind of all the things that are just automatically you're logged to some like user staging on production and you get all, all the stuff. So really, it's really easy for totally new users because we want to onboard like a huge number of people from different teams. It's a big company and uh, it, it must be very easy for people to use. Okay. And I give my microphone to my colleague for the next part. So, um, first of all, we named it Prometheus because, yeah, like I said, it was like, we, we got to bring fire to the masses and, and five seconds later we thought, well, Prometheus is already like a, a very popular uh, Kubernetes tool, maybe we should name it something else. And I said, it's not like we're ever going to like be on a stage at a Kubernetes conference, so we can name it whatever we want. Um, <laughs> we ended up naming it Promete because uh, that's the Serbian version of it, but um, so if there's any confusion, it's not actually... Prometheus, Prometheus. But um, on top of that, you know, to, to, to give you more of a context of, of what, what Milos was alluding to, a year ago, um, I was on the data science team, I, um, and I hated Kubeflow. It was a thing that um, people, the, that MLOps was setting up, and I was like, it's so clunky, and uh, you know, I, I've used like Prefect and all kinds of other tools, and I'm like, I'm just going to do this myself. And uh, the person who was uh, the original head of ML Ops was very much an infrastructure person, and she did an amazing job of actually setting it up. She left um, last March, last April, and they came to me and said, hey, you should take over that job. And I said, well, I hate Kubeflow, and I don't, I, I'm the guy that's always trying to get, <laughs> kind of sneak around it. And they're like, well, that's why you have to, that's why you have to be the guy. You have to make it a, an actual tool that people like you, data scientists, uh, not only tolerate, but really enjoy. 
And so we've been kind of obsessed and thinking like, okay, uh, we, we've done a lot to get it as infrastructure, as a robust tool from the ground up running, but there's a lot missing from, from the, the kind of the bottom down, right? From the data science the developer experience um, to actually getting it to run. So a ton of work on, you know, taking, taking stuff that's already in Q4 that's already really nice, the, the, you know, the pipeline and, and component decorators, the SDK, and sort of just wrapping extra goodies in there, right? So what are the kind of things that, you know, what are the kind of things that we want to kind of add to the, the Q, Qflow compiler and, in, and we injected them. Once we got that up and running, like, like, like Milos said, we, we had, um, and this was not so much a Qflow issue, but I think Qflow, we saw Qflow as an opportunity of a place where people could run, run serious jobs and share their work in the notebooks um, in a way that they weren't able to do before. And once we started, once we started saying like, okay, what is, what is the universe of things that we're building? You know, all these data scientists across multiple teams are building, you know, t a lot of time series forecasting, right? We always want to know like how many Mountain Dews are we going to sell tomorrow, right? We do recommendations, we do, you know, uh, marketing modeling, and, and just various visualizations on EDA. So like, what are the, what are the kind of tools that we can, we can bring up that abstraction chain? What, like, and, and a lot of which was already there. Um, things like, one thing that we started, um, even in the last, especially in the last month, I keep trying to like uh, point out to people that we can do, you know, we can put plotly plots directly in pipelines as as metrics, as outputs, you know, save HTML, and people thought like we did something really impressive, but it's really just, you know, K Kubernetes, or sorry, Q you know, uh, Qflow um, can output that pretty nicely. So, um, do you want to go to the next slide? So, this is uh, an example of, so we were talking about before, like, you know, we, we, we went in all these different repos and we used Snowflake for basically all of our data. And everybody had their own notebook that was like on some random branch of some random project. And then they had one like, file called utils. And then there was like 200 lines to connect to Snowflake. And then you're like, okay, I don't know why you're doing it exactly. This is fine. Uh, and then you would find these all over the place. Every, every, everybody's got their own like 100 or 200 lines to like, read some secrets or read a file, and we're like, no, no, no. Come, come to Qflow. You'll get a better machine anyway if you really need to scale out. And we'll make it, you know, you add your SQL query, everything else is basically defined for you. Um, you'll see here, actually, so we define, like, different clouds. One of the big things that, like I said, when I took over a year ago, um, they were like, oh, by the way, also, we're switching from AWS to Azure. And I thought, like, okay, this is going to be how I get fired because it's not going to work. And to, to you know, a lot of I think a lot of a lot of tools talk about being kind of cloud agnostic and making that switch easy. This actually was pretty easy switch. I mean, there were some permissions we had to change here and there, but actually, like the the kind of lift from Kubeflow AWS to Kubeflow Azure was uh, pretty much pretty much pain free. Um, total aside, but so that gives you an idea of like the kind of stuff, right? Uh, def, you know, co common components defined in a single line. Do you want to go to the next one? Um, and then, you know, here's, here's another problem that data scientists have been um, doing kind of on their own in a ton of different ways. So we said, okay, if, if everyone kind of is interested in doing data drift, let's find that, like, what's, we're, okay, get all your, let's get all our code together, let's sit down, let's figure out what are the tools, what are the, like, what is a common component that you can do, you know, you can say from, from the main set of components, import, and then you're just kind of plugging in Right, you're plugging into your pipeline these common components. We want to make things, we want to make the easy things easy and the hard things possible. So, of course, it's always you know trivial for you to say, I want to I want to start from a you know the most generic Qflow component, add add to packages and 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 build my own thing. You can certainly always do that, but we're trying to build more and more as we see it where it makes sense, um, build things up that abstraction chain. Um, So, yeah, obviously a big part of this was um, was a culture shift, right? Uh, going from going from having either you know our data scientists either you know they, they heard the word Kubeflow and they knew it was like this thing that you know IT was like going to make them use or something, and we really needed to we really needed to make them um, kind of accountable. Like you have to use Kubeflow 
and we have to make it easy for you to use. Um, do you want to go to the next slide? And yeah, so uh, we're super fanat we're super fanatical about um, about our users, and um, again, Milos kind of alluded to this. More and more, we've been taking um, for people that are interested, data, like data engineers who have uh, data engineers who sit on on in, in projects where there's not enough of a there's not enough of a, of a reason to bring in like an entire data science team to that project, but they need some sort of uh, some sort of analysis, right? Some sort of model, and th they're happy to you know uh, pull open Scikit-Learn or even PyTorch and and build something simple to, to get some quick analysis out. Um, so we've been, we've been, and these are people that use Airflow a ton, so we've been trying to make, um, make it so that onboarding basically anybody who knows Python, don't even have to be a data scientist, but obviously you wanna use, you know, you wanna use some models. How do we get you into Python? How do we get use it? Um, is Terry the next one? Okay, so uh, you'll see my giant bald head in there, but we, we, we've taken kind of like this real like community, kind of a community open source approach to the whole project of, we're making tons of, you know, tons of tutorials and how to's and demos. Uh, we have it in like this big playlist internally. Um, we bring people on and we, we, make the, we make them write code. We'll say like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna film you writing a pipeline for the first time, even though you have no idea what Kubeflow is. And um, some people are amenable to that, some, some are not. So. We've got one, in fact, uh, kind of a, a, a testimonial from, from, from one of our data engineers. Oh. Me with the data science team in the past and remember being extremely intimidated by some of the tasks. I successfully completed them. <laughs> I'll admit. Building pipelines has never been my strong suit, and I still struggle to this day. Now I'm far from an expert, and I'm fairly new to both machine learning and Kubeflow. Yet, I was able to create a pipeline with just a few lines of code using Prometheus. Prometheus removes the guesswork, making machine learning more accessible for developers at any level. Okay, I told her not to make it sound like such an ad, but um, yeah, so, 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 so Terry, Terry's a data engineer and she's on this project for Kroger, which is a big retailer in the US. And it was a project where the data was kind of eh, it was small, it was not so good, but they wanted some, some EDA, they wanted some, some kind of small models and, and Terry was like, you know, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. So she got up and running, um, you know, we, we kind of walked her through the general UI of Kubeflow and, and then our tooling and yeah, probably 20, 30 lines of code later, she had, I think, a random forest or something, and, and people seem to be pretty happy with the results. And, um, you know, so that's something we're trying to really do uh, as we go. Obviously, make it so the kind of data scientists that come to us and say, hey, I need three GPUs and a tensor board and all the goodies, you'll get that. Or, hey, I don't even really have a data science ML, you know, sort of problem, but I want to I look at some visuals really quick. And Airflow doesn't really do that very well for us and, and this and that. And um, we, we want that to be a, kind of a, a more general place for people to, to experiment there. So um, at that point, questions, I guess? Questions? Hello. Um, yes, my first question, well, I don't know if I will have several, but um, yes, did, did you need to integrate uh, this authenticator that you talked at the beginning, like one click authenticator to use in Kubeflow? Do you need to integrate with some something else than, than DEX? I know this is the authenticator that comes with the Kubeflow installation at the beginning, uh, because where we have some problems like integrating this with Kubeflow and other things that we have in the company. So that's, that's a question. Thank you. Um, yeah, the one click authenticator, it's, it's right now, it's a bit of a hack, but it's growing into proper software or like, which is like several try, accept, if else, sacks. Um, yeah, the, the, the original, I think eventually we were going to try to get onto SSO. Um, that's going to be definitely easier said than done. But yeah, for, for DEX, you know, we, our, our authentication is to, um, 
no, so yeah, the, 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 the workflow is basically go, to, go onto the VPN, our VPN, go to our, you know, the Qflow UI, Dex pops up, you click GitHub, you authenticate through your GitHub, you have to go through SSO through your GitHub, you have to authorize that. Now you, if you're lucky and you remember like what you even came there for, you're in Qflow. And then, you know, if you, if, if, if you, if you do that, um, you know, obviously like the, the sort of GitHub authentication will stick around uh, in the SSO for, you know, for us for, you know, for a couple of days at least. Um, so you have to do it every time, but it's still painful enough that like, you know, I think, I think people will just not, you know, if it's like, even if it takes like five minutes to just get set up and, um, you know, click through the UI, then you, then you gotta go get a cookie. You gotta, like we have to put that cookie in some environment variable and then, you know, it's a whole, and then, and then people want to switch between environments. You got to do the whole thing again to move to a different environment. So yeah, the, the, the one click is basically we took uh, a Chrome driver and just kind of did all, do all that for you and kind of step through the process. And if you need to log in, um, you know, it's saved in Chrome and everything. So you just kind of click a button if you have to. And yeah, like I said, it's a little bit of hack. We're working on making it um, a little bit, uh, a little bit more robust though. But people, I mean, people, I've been using it a ton and I've been honestly using Qflow a lot more just cause it's like, Oh yeah, I'll just I'll go to the I'll go to, I'll go to the UI. I'll, I'll click the same way you do like with GitHub. GitHub auth login, it pops open. You hit yes, and, and you're in. So, question. Hi, thanks for your talk. I think it's really interesting, and I see a lot of um, common patterns. So maybe can you give us a bit more details on um, why you chose to build your own components library? and uh, what this tool actually does, uh, aside from the authentication, like pushing pipelines, or, um, yeah, a bit more details on those. So, regarding that example, you have something that's, like, repeating over and over again, like, they need to connect to Snowflake, because our data are in Snowflake. So, as I said, like, during the presentation, no need for them to just go and write again and again the same code. Also, this components, let's say, that are pre-built, they're already handling all the secrets and all that stuff. So they don't, before, you know, you have to, like say, you have to authenticate, so you need to attach with some secrets. Then sometimes in the secret files, like the names are not like the same exactly. Then you have to like change it. And there's a lot of, a lot of those things that just like a waste of time for users and they're confusing, especially if they don't have the background. So all these things are hidden. And also, like, if you want to, let's say, we're talking about data drift, like, no need to, like, re reinvent the wheel, like, just use this component, this is input, this is output, and include it in. So practically building, and this is pro in process, so we are still expanding from project to project. So imagine if we are doing some, let's say, time series forecasting, for specific products for one retailer. And then the other group of people are doing the, let's say, uh, comparable thing for another retailer. Like, they will just waste their time. If they have the components, you can just reuse here and there, and you don't have to think about all the underlying Kubernetes things. Yes, thank you. So, uh, can you give us an example of other types of components other than like data loaders? I think a good one is, um, we didn't really advertise it a ton here just because I didn't want to show off tons of SQL, I guess. Um, one, one, one big thing we have, and you know, a lot of this again is like some of its cultural problems that we're not, we're not necessarily trying to solve with um, technology, uh, technical solutions, but um, we think they're like making it easier to have those conversations. One is, um, you know, like sourcing data and, um, you know, we, like when we started working with data engineers more, we, we brought them in and said like, can you look at some of the way we source data? And they would oftentimes be like, well, that's not even the right table. We switched that months ago and this is a total, totally unoptimized query, et cetera, et cetera. So we started making common, you know, a common library of data sources, right? Because, you know, we, something like Amazon sales is the kind of thing we're gonna wanna use in a thousand projects or, right? So do that kind of once. And then um, that component is now kind of declarative because in some, t you know, this particular query um, in, in, a dev, in a dev environment has certain things that need to happen, you know, different roles, different this and that. You can declare it all in one, in one component and then we'll know just, okay, we're in, we're in the environment that needs the, this kind of setup. 
adding pod annotations, adding like, you know, kind of Kubernetes level stuff for, for being able to monitor and track. Because um, we don't want people to say like, okay, go add a pod annotation and change this thing and this V1 selector or whatever, right? So the, 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 the kind of data library is a big one. And then one that Milos spent a ton of time on was, was the hyperparameter tuning, right? Like making that, um, you know, making that as, as, as simple as, as simple as basically a one decorator to, to set it up for um, across, you know, different, you know, different modeling types and, and that sort of thing, so. Thank you very much.